Welcome to Philip Gaming. I'm Philip O'Reilly and I'm going to be reviewing the new one. It's history and all of the EO system models, games, and enhanced DVD movies. It's the 20th anniversary of the new one being released in July of the year 2000, 20 years ago, and I'm here to celebrate. Sometimes the beginning of one company comes out of the failings of another. This is a company that formed from ex-Atari employees in 1995 to produce new gaming experiences and technology. That company became VM Labs, creators of the Nuon. This wouldn't be the first time employees left Atari and formed their own company. In fact, the first major exodus happened 16 years earlier in 1979. They formed the first third-party game company, Activision. Like Activision, VM Labs had many employees that created content for the current Atari system of the time, in this case, for the Atari Jaguar. VM Labs, the company that created the new one, was a tech company startup that formed in 1995 by Richard Miller, who was once vice president of Atari Corporation from 1989 to 1994. In June of 1996, VM Labs created the first alpha chip for their platform, then a working beta chip in April of 1997. In the November 1997 issue of Next Generation Magazine, an article about VM Labs' new system codenamed Project X was introduced as a Mario killer in the making, with an image of a giant X crushing something, leaving a trail of blood with a red Mario hat adjacent. A pretty bold attack on Nintendo and their Nintendo 64, the most powerful game system at the time, indicating that early on in development, their strategy was to go head to head with the game console manufacturers of the time. By 1999, their strategy seemed to have broadened beyond just the hardcore gamer to audio video media enthusiasts, especially since by 1999, the Sega Dreamcast had been released at this point with very competitive graphics. In 1999, VM Labs created the first Ares chip, and in 2000, they would have the first milestone with the Ares 2 processor being integrated into the first line of Nuon players. VM Labs released the final chip, the Ares 3 processor, in 2001 and was available on European Nuon models. The first Ares chips were manufactured with assistance from Motorola, further linking its similarities to the Atari Jaguar, which also had a Motorola chip integrated into the system. The chips even had the Motorola logo printed on them, while the Ares 3 chip was a sole VM Labs creation. Some notable staff of VM Labs include John Matheson, Vice President of Technology, then Product Development at VM Labs. He designed many components of the Nuon chip, including the audio subsystem. When he was formerly at Flare Technology, he was one of the creators of the technology that became the Atari Jaguar. Jeff Minter, VM Labs team member that helped in designing the Nuon chip, 2D graphics libraries. He also created Tempest 3000 and the Virtual Light Machine 2 for the Nuon. For the Atari Jaguar, he worked on the Defender 2000, Tempest 2000, and the Virtual Light Machine for the Atari Jaguar CD. Bill Raybuck. Vice President in charge of content development at VM Labs. He negotiated deals between game software publishers and electronic manufacturers such as Toshiba, Samsung, and Motorola. Bill Raybuck was previously the Vice President of Research and Development and Technical Support at Sony Computer Entertainment America from 1996 to 1998, where he headed North American PlayStation Library Development, Development Support, and Peripheral Licensing. He was also responsible for the launch of the Net Yurazu hobbyist development system for PlayStation. Prior to Sony, Bill Raybuck was Vice President of Atari Corp in charge of software business development from 1990 to 1995. He brought many games to the Atari Jaguar, including Myst, Wolfenstein 3D, and Doom. The new one was a different kind of game system. Instead of being a game system that could play DVDs, the new one was marketed as a DVD player that could also play games. Early development of the Nuon started in 1996, at a time before any game system had a DVD player included. By 1999, much progress was made, but the year 2000 was rapidly approaching with new game systems on the way. The first Nuon model, the Samsung Xtiva DVD N2000, was released in July of 2000, three months before the PlayStation 2 was released in the United States, but four months after the PlayStation 2 was released in Japan in March of 2000. Released at the price of $349, the new one was more expensive than the PlayStation 2, which initially launched at $299, but it wasn't aiming to be a direct competitor to the PlayStation 2. It was aiming at the home theater market, and it showed. It had a remote included in the box, component video output, a headphone input jack, and HD CD support. While it wasn't trying to directly compete with the PlayStation 2, some of its specs were very comparable to it. It had a quad-core 108MHz processor and 32MB of RAM, while the PlayStation 2 had a 300MHz processor, also with 32MB of RAM. 
While everyone was hyped for the PlayStation 2, almost no one even knew what the new one was, even at the time of release. Unless you were a consumer that kept up with high-end home theater electronics equipment or read certain gaming magazines. I remember seeing a new one player once on my local Tweeter. Tweeter was a high-end electronics retailer that later went defunct in 2008. I had fond memories of going to Tweeter, even going back to the 90s when the stores in my area were called DOW Dow. These stores were the cutting edge of technology in the 90s, introducing DVD technology and high-definition television to consumers. The new one players easily blended in with other DVD players at the time. One would need a keen eye to spot a DVD player with new on capabilities. You would have to look out for the Nuon badge on the player, among the many other badges on the system, and the sometimes hidden Nuon controller ports on the front of the system. Three different models were released in the United States that could play game discs. The Samsung Xdiva DVD N2000, the Toshiba SD2300, and the Samsung DVD N501. There were also some models with limited game playing features including two RCA players, two Motorola set-top boxes, two Samsung models released in Europe, and one Korean model, each with varying capabilities. The company that created Nuon, VM Labs, wanted Nuon ships in as many DVD players as possible, licensing Nuon out to different manufacturers, but they only ended up licensing out to four different companies. There's a total of seven games released for the Nuon, eight if you also include the South Korean only released Creon Shinchan, as well as a handful of demo sampler compilations. That's fewer games than even the Sega 32X or the Nintendo Virtual Boy. In addition to the seven games released, there were only four Nuon enhanced DVD movies released. Every US Nuon player plays DVD video, video CDs, HD CDs, and audio CDs. The Samsung Xdiva DVD N2000 was the first Nuon player, released in July 2000. It has a picture resolution of 360 by 240, featuring the best picture zooming capabilities out of all Nuon players at 20x zoom, and an impressive 100 effects within its virtual light machine, a pleasant visual feature when playing audio CDs. Unique features for this player include a headphone jack, a jog shuttle wheel, and a Dolby Digital Decoder. The Samsung DVD N501, available in a shiny silver color. This more compact player was released in the first half of 2001 with a resolution of 180 by 120, providing the poorest resolution in Nuon players, featuring also the weakest zoom at 15x, yet it has the most impressive virtual light machine effects at 152 effects and an even better beat detection. Unique features for this player include CDR support to play burned discs, and it is the only player that plays all demo discs and homebrew discs. This player is also the only one that plays MP3 files. The Toshiba SD2300 has a stylish push-in flip-down cover that conceals its Nuon ports when the controller isn't inserted. This player was released in mid to late 2000 after the Samsung Xdiva DVD N2000. The Toshiba SD2300 has a 360x240 resolution, featuring a decent 16x zoom and virtual light machine that unfortunately has the weakest amount of effects at only 8 effects. Controllers The Hot Products Stealth Controller, a controller designed in a Nintendo 64 controller style mold, comes in a purple and blue color and also in black, with a button color scheme identical to the Nintendo 64 controller colors. For many gamers, this seems to be the best controller option for the new one. It has quick response times, a good analog stick, and a Z button under the controller that serves as an additional A button. The Hot Products Warrior Digital Gamepad, a black controller that reminds me of the Microsoft Sidewinder gamepad. It's missing an analog stick, so it would not be ideal for games like Iron Soldier 3, where the analog stick is the preferred method for movement. The Logitech Gamepad, it's a black controller featuring a digital D-pad and an analog thumbstick. It has a fairly modern design with control options similar to a Nintendo 64 or Dreamcast controller, only missing a second analog stick which was only starting to become the standard control scheme at the time with controllers like the PlayStation DualShock and PS2 DualShock 2, but no games for the Nuon utilize this control scheme. The Logitech gamepad came out in mid-2001, well after the launch of the Nuon. Some people prefer the HBI Stealth over the Logitech gamepad because of Logitech's slower response time in button detection and an analog stick that doesn't work as well as the HBI Stealth. It still has a quality build, a great design, and in my opinion, it is the best controller to use with the Nuon. The Samsung Nuon controller. It's a great controller that looks exactly like a third-party digital PlayStation controller. It's also missing an analog stick, so it would not be ideal for games where the analog stick is the preferred method for movement. 
It has horrible button placement, placing the two main action buttons, the A and B buttons, in the center of the controller, making them almost impossible to use while gripping the controller. This controller was only available in South Korea, thankfully, so Americans didn't have to suffer from its many shortfalls. Remotes work on some games with simple movement like ballistic, but they're not the ideal method for playing games if you have the option of using the controller. You have to have your remote in line of sight with the player in order for it to read your inputs, or else your inputs won't read. Samsung Xtiva DVD N2000 Remote A dark gray remote that's shorter than the Toshiba remote, but marginally wider in its top half. The directional pad does not protrude out of the remote like the Toshiba remote. It's designed so the remote has a smoother surface. It in fact sits lower than the buttons, making it harder to access for precise movements. This works well enough for DVD menus, but troublesome when it comes to pinpoint accuracy in video games. The Toshiba SD2300 remote is a black remote that's longer than the Samsung Xtiva remote and has a more symmetrical design. The remote has a cleaner, less cluttered design with the bottom half of the remote having a flip down door concealing the rest of the buttons. Perhaps a minor inconvenience, but more aesthetically pleasing to the eye. The raised directional pad is easier to access than that of the Xtiva remote, in turn being better to use in gaming. Although. I would still not recommend using it as a primary controller if a controller designed for gaming is available. The Samsung DVD N501 remote is a silver remote that is smaller and more symmetrical than the Xtiva remote. Buttons are placed a little tighter than the other remotes, making button presses a bit more inconvenient. Of the few games released for the system, many of the games released for the new one were sequels to Atari Jaguar games. Tempest 3000 was a sequel to Tempest 2000 on the Atari Jaguar. Iron Soldier 3 was a sequel to Iron Soldier 2 and Iron Soldier on the Atari Jaguar. Virtual Light Machine 2, built into Nuon players, was an updated Virtual Light Machine for the Atari Jaguar CD. Also, to a lesser extent, Merlin Racing was a spiritual successor to Atari Karts on the Atari Jaguar, having been made by the same team that worked on that game. Ballistic was released in June of 2000. It was made by Infogrames and published by Samsung. It's also available on PlayStation and Game Boy Color. Ballistic is a puzzle game for one or two players. It was the first game ever available for the Nuon. It was only available as a pack-in game with the Samsung Xtiva DVD N2000 and the Samsung DVD N501. A few of the European Samsung N504s include the game as well. There's three different gameplay modes, Panic Mode, Stage Mode, and Versus Mode, including options for Easy, Normal, and Hard Difficulty. Panic Mode is an endless game mode where you play as long as you can before getting the game over, with level difficulty increasing steadily. You have to match three balls or more of the same color to eliminate them by launching different colored balls from the central rotatable mechanism. It's a good idea to eliminate larger groups of balls of the same color. Sometimes eliminating balls causes balls of the same color surrounding them to be eliminated once they join together, causing a satisfying cascading effect. You have to act quickly before the balls reach the center. To get a high score, you can enter your initials in the high score ranking. Stage mode is a mode where you have to eliminate a set number of balls in one stage to progress to the next stage. In the normal difficulty setting, the speed rapidly increases, making even stage 1 2 challenging to beat because of the time crunch. Versus mode is a two-player mode where you compete head-to-head -head with someone to beat the other player in stages. First player to win two stages wins. The 
graphics in this game can easily be done on 16-bit systems like the Sega Genesis or the Super Nintendo, with the game using 2D sprites. For a simple puzzle game, highly detailed graphics aren't too necessary, so graphics are not the most important aspect of the game. The music ranges from different soothing tropical island music tracks to a fast-paced track that keeps you on edge when you're getting close to a game over, similar to how Tetris increases the speed of the music when you're getting close to losing. No music tracks really stood out here. Sometimes the music stutters, not only when transitioning from different music tracks, but also within the music tracks themselves. Free Fall 3050 AD was released in December of 2000. This is an action game for one player. Free Fall 3050 AD was an original game for the new one. It wouldn't be till roughly 18 years later that was later ported to Windows in January 2019, and also a port for Xbox that was originally cancelled was unofficially released as open source in August 2019. This game was developed by Total Arcade Software and VM Labs, and published in 2000 by DVD International. The opening cinematic shows a dystopian world, a newspaper with the current events, hovercraft police cars and taxis in a futuristic cityscape. We then see a character jumping out of a building. The main menu gives you the choice between starting the mission and options. The options menu has options for difficulty, turning the auto air brake on or off, sound, controls, and credits. To me, giving the player the option to see the credits is a sign that either the game is either too hard, too long, or too boring for a player to play through to finish and earn a viewing of the end credits. When selecting to start a mission, you could begin at either missions 1, 2, 3, or 4, including a training mode and password input options. Because the new one did not have a way for you to save progress like the PlayStation or Nintendo 64 allowed you to do. The training mode gives you the opportunity to learn how to use the camera, landing, special weapons, and air brakes. Graphics. In my opinion, this is the best looking game for the new one, with graphics on par with Sega Dreamcast and early PlayStation 2 games, showcasing the power the new one chip can unlock in a DVD player with a decent amount of polygons and an intro scene that would make any 90s FMV game jealous. Free Fall 3050 AD features a pumped up techno soundtrack with a beat that fits the futuristic setting well. Gameplay As the name of the game implies, the game has you control a character in a suit as they free fall down the sky while shooting at enemies, avoiding obstacles, and making landings. Using the left trigger and directional pad, you have to maneuver your character 360 degrees and destroy enemies that are firing upon you. The character is hard to control, making 360 degree movement difficult as well as making strafing hard to do. If you can master the controls, then I would recommend the game. Iron Soldier 3 was released in June of 2001. Iron Soldier 3 is an action mech game for one or two players. It is also available on PlayStation. Iron Soldier 3 was developed by Eclipse Software Design and published by VM Labs. 
Some models and Nuon players were incompatible with the completed final version of the game and were pulled from stores as soon as they arrived. As a result, some disc-only versions of the game were made freely available through the Nuon Dome website until an official commercial release was to be made available. Many of these copies can be identified by the words demo, not for resale, having been sharpied on the discs and a few without Sharpie marks were also distributed. Only about 200 to 300 copies were made available, with the final box game never seeing a release. At startup, we're introduced to a nice looking flaming Iron Soldier 3 logo. The beginning of the game has a video intro showing mechs, tanks, and helicopters. Even a machine that appears to be a P-5000 powered workloader straight out of the movie Aliens. We see a person running in a hangar, jumping into a mech. At the main menu, you can select between New Game, Load Game, Options, Storyline, High Scores, Credits, and Demo. The Load Game feature doesn't load a save game because the Nuon lacked a save feature. Instead, a screen appears to enter a code for the desired level. The options menu has many options to customize your game, from display options, sound adjustment, and control options. Selecting storyline just gives you the quick Iron Soldier 3 backstory over the opening intro video. High scores, well, that's self-explanatory, along with the credits, giving you the game credits. Demo shows recorded gameplay from a selection of various levels. Once you select new game, on the next menu screen you can choose your mission type, difficulty setting, and style of mech. Graphics. The graphics in the new port of Iron Soldier 3 are superior to those on the PlayStation port, with a far draw distance and a good polygon count for the time. These graphics are pretty decent for 2001 standards, making it one of the best looking new games. Audio. Iron Soldier 3 has a fast paced techno soundtrack, like Freefall 3050 AD. Works well with its futuristic combat setting. Gameplay. In mission mode, you must complete your objective in order to advance to the next level mission all while tanks, helicopters, and other craft are attacking you. Arcade mode lacks the mission objectives and is more of an open, free experience. Before you begin, another step is required before you jump into gameplay. You must select the weapons to be installed on your mech. Sally, all cannot be chosen, so choose wisely. An analog stick is the preferred method for movement, so controllers with that one are not ideal. The controls are a bit clunky. In order to aim and look around, the D-pad or analog stick is used, but in order to move, the D-pad or analog stick along with the down seat button have to be pressed, then pressed again to stop. This could have been easily corrected if either the D-pad or the analog stick were used to aim, and the other one was used to move. Unfortunately, none of the controller configuration options give you this option. 
Maybe having weapons accessible on the other buttons like the down C button would improve the speed of gameplay. Iron Soldier 3 is a great game in concept, but not the greatest in execution in my opinion. Merlin Racing was released in December of 2000. It's a racing game for one or two players. It was created by Miracle Designs and published by VM Labs. This is an original game for the new one, with some inspiration from Atari Karts. There's a reskin of Merlin Racing for the PlayStation called Rascal Racers, using most of the same characters and graphics, even starring the same raccoon Rocco with the number 3 cart. There's also a sequel to Merlin Racing published in 2003 for the PlayStation called XS Airboat Racing, later also released for the PSP and PlayStation 3. At the main menu, you have three options, Start Game, Password, and Options. Select Password to input a password. This was used in place of a save feature. The Options menu allows you to adjust the sound, input a player name, and show records of fastest times. Graphics. There's a greater draw distance here than what's available on the Nintendo 64, meaning no fog, with graphics on par with Diddy Kong Racing. I could possibly see this game being able to be ported to the Nintendo 64 as an expansion pack required game. Merlin Racing has some playful melodies that are well suited for the cute animal theme of this game, giving this game a more kiddie atmosphere. Gameplay Merlin Racing has four gameplay modes, Arcade, Adventure, Time Trial, and Tournament. There are 10 selectable characters and 25 levels to choose from in Arcade mode. Adventure mode begins by showing you an animal character doing an activity. You can move left or right to choose between the other characters, all of them doing various activities. Once a character is selected, the story begins with text being displayed on the lower part of the screen while a witch circles around Merlin the wizard trapped in a cage. This goes on for an extremely long amount of time. Thankfully, the text can be sped up by pressing the A button or skipped altogether by pressing the Star button. We then come to a screen while we're introduced to Athena. You will then have to beat each level by arriving in the first place in order to unlock keys to open up new levels. You begin inside a castle courtyard overworld with all the level doors being laid out throughout the castle walls. Gameplay is very reminiscent to that of Diddy Kong Racing with different vehicle types, cute cuddly animal characters, speed boosters on the ground, and similar obtainable items. If you get hit in the game and you're holding an item, you lose whatever item you had in inventory. The different vehicles you could use depend upon the level they are appropriate for, with carts, hover spacecraft, and airboats being the different vehicles available. In Time Trail, you race on a track on your own without computer players competing against you. No items are available to collect. The objective is to get the best time. In Tournament, you compete in one of six different Championship Cups, each with four different race courses. You can still advance in the tournament if you don't achieve first place. Your place scores you points that are tallied up in the scoring system. If you manage to obtain the most, second most, or third most points, you will be placed at the winner's podium at your respective place. The game may look and sound like a game for young children, but it can be quite challenging. I'd recommend this game to people who enjoy challenging kart racing games. Space Invaders XL was released in June of 2001. It's a space shooter for one or two players. Presented by Taito and Matahari Studios. This is the last officially released Nuon game. Space Invaders XL is a port of the 1999 Japanese PlayStation game Space Invaders X. At startup, we're greeted with a Taito logo, complete with a cute Japanese soundbite that says Taito. At the menu, you can choose between Space Invaders, Battle Mode, Time Attack, or Options. When you choose Space Invaders, you are given four options. You could play in Classic Mode, Overlay Mode, Reflector, or Color Mode. Classic Mode gives you the original game as it was made in 1978.
overlay mode shows you the game, but what it would have looked like in the arcade with a physical screen overlay to make you feel more of the arcade experience of being at the actual arcade cabinet. Screen overlays were used in black and white games to give them the appearance of color. Reflector mode is a variant on the screen overlay mode, with a colorful planetary space theme set behind the black and white on-screen characters. Color mode gives you Space Invaders in color. Battle mode gives you the opportunity to play against a friend or the CPU in quick battles in a simplified Space Invaders game that takes up half the screen. There are no shield barriers to hide behind, giving you faster action. Time Attack Mode presents you with the best looking version of Space Invaders out of the other versions. With updated graphics sprites that look 16-bit, your objective is to get the fastest time possible in a series of time levels. The options menu allows you to change the gameplay style, amount of lives, starting level, and more. Graphics When it comes to graphics, Space Invaders is as simple as they come. Originally released in 1978 in arcades, almost any system could pull off the graphics needed for Space Invaders. Some neat backgrounds and overlays are added to help spice things up, especially with the slightly upgraded graphics in the time attack mode. But Space Invaders XL is hardly a graphics pusher. It is the game for the new one with possibly the simplest graphics. Audio. Classic mode on Space Invaders XL lacks music, but it does have some neat sound effects. The sound effects of the invaders are like a hypnotic beating heart. A screeching laser shot sound coming from the ship also adds to the intensity. The sound effects carry a presence indeed. It definitely doesn't push the audio capabilities of the new one, but it does a job with being faithful to the source material. In battle mode, we are finally given music. The game starts off with sirens blaring, then a fast-paced electronic 80s dance music beat with 15 different music tracks to choose from. Time Attack mode also has the music tracks, only lacking the sirens at the start of the level. Gameplay Space Invaders XL, whose original game was a late 70s era space shooter that took the world by storm in 1978, being one of the first space shooters around. Your goal is to shoot down all the invaders to go on to the next level, with shield barriers used to block enemy fire. It has a methodical left to right march that's very rigid. The original reason that the game sped up when more invaders were shot down was because our original arcade machine couldn't handle the amount of invaders on the screen, so it was slowed down due to the processor doing its best that it could with the limited hardware. The game was great for its time, but I'm not a fan of it. It wouldn't be until the following year in 1979 when Galaxy came out that I feel that the space shooter started to hit its stride. Tempest 3000 was released in December of 2000. It's a space shooter for one or two players. Tempest 3000 is a game licensed by Hasbro Interactive and Atari Interactive. It was designed by Jeff Minter internally at VM Labs. Tempest 3000 is a new one exclusive release. It's a sequel to Tempest 2000 for the Atari Jaguar. At the startup, we get a screen that warns us about extreme danger. Danger. Extreme danger. danger. We have the options to choose between have a go at Tempest 3000 or options and goodies. Once you select have a go at Tempest 3000, you have the options to start a one player game or two player game at the next screen or enter a password to go to another level. Graphics. Tempest 3000 retains the wireframe look of its original 1981 game almost making you feel like you're viewing classic vector graphics, but with even more spectacular colorful visuals than previously done on a Tempest game. The visuals are striking, some comparing them to being on a psychedelic trip and hallucinating, but I wouldn't know. The game has bright colors from the whole spectrum of the rainbow set above a dark black void. Audio. Tempest 3000 has an upbeat, positive, fast-paced sound. 
complete with amazing sound effects and voice samples. I find that amusing when I lose a life and the game tells me, oops, loser, in a female European voice. Oops, loser. Tempest 3000 is an interesting auditory experience. Gameplay. Your goal is to maneuver your ship around different geometric shapes while firing at deadly creatures coming up from below. Defeat all the baddies to progress to the next level. There's an array of different enemies and level shapes to see, with clever level names like Try Harder to greet you in a triangle shaped level. If you enjoy classic arcade games, then I would recommend Tempest 3000. The next Tetris was released in January of 2001. It's a puzzle game for one player. It's a game designed by Animatech International and Blue Planet Software and published by Hasbro. The next Tetris is also available on the PlayStation, PC, and the Sega Dreamcast. The first run of the next Tetris games were only available to those who purchased a Toshiba SD2300 and mailed in a registration card to get one once it became available. Later on, the game was included in the box along with the Toshiba SD2300. The game was never released separately even though a release was planned. The game starts up with a video infomercial on the Nuon showing the various Nuon features available. If you grow tired of watching the video, simply press start to skip it to go right to the main menu. Is performance charred, providing new and improved features that make the movie viewing experience more exciting and engaging. In the main menu, we can select clips, games, about Nuon, and the next Tetris. In Clips, you get to see clips of various upcoming Nuon games, even some unreleased Nuon games like A-Maze, Dragon Slayer, and Riven. Some cool hidden features on the next Tetris disc are game demos. In game demos, you can play a demo of Merlin Racing. The course Capital City is available to play. A demo of Tempest 3000 is also available, showcasing the selection of levels in the game. The main attraction is also here in the game section with the full version of the next Tetris. About Nuon shows the startup video infomercial about the Nuon. Nuon transforms any television into a state-of-the-art interactive entertainment center. Selecting the next Tetris on the main menu screen is the easiest way to start playing the game. An opening cinematic showing scenic landscapes and waterfalls introduces us to the game, with Tetris pieces sitting at the bottom of the waterfalls.
At the main menu, you have the option to choose between the next Tetris and Classic Tetris. Graphics. The game is more detailed than the 8-bit versions from the 80s, but there's not much more you can do to spruce up the graphics in Tetris. The graphics are good for Tetris. Audio. The next Tetris brings back some nostalgia by using some remixes from the NES Tetris game, as well as having some new tracks. The next Tetris uses electronic dance music tracks to give the player an energetic feel. If you clear 3 or 4 rows, an audio clip will say the amount of rows cleared. Gameplay. Classic Tetris is the game most of us know and love. It's the most popular puzzle video game out there. You take control of various descending Tetris pieces and place them so they make a solid roll and become eliminated. As you progress through different levels, the game speed increases and any mistakes made keep piling up. You lose once your pieces reach to the top of the screen and you can't land any more pieces down. It's a fun challenge game that's easy to pick up and play. One nitpick I have is when you pause the game, in order to unpause the game, you have to hit the action button, unpausing the game while rotating the Tetris piece at the same time. It could be quite annoying. In the next Tetris, the objective is to clear the bottom row in order to advance to the next level before the timer runs out, with Tetris pieces already have been placed in the level. When some pieces of different colors get eliminated, pieces of Tetris break off and fall to a lower position. These changes mix up the classic Tetris formula enough to make the game feel familiar yet fresh. Marathon mode of the next Tetris works similar to the regular mode except the timer counts up instead of down, giving a slightly different dynamic to the gameplay. Only two film studios ended up releasing new unenhanced DVD movies, 20th Century Fox and MGM. Bedazzled, a film released by 20th Century Fox on March 13, 2001. Bedazzled is a remake of the original 1967 Bedazzled film. It is the only new unenhanced DVD movie to be released before VM Labs declared bankruptcy. Bedazzled is a campy year 2000 comedy starring Brandon Fraser and Elizabeth Hurley. Bedazzled was directed by none other than Harold Ramis, also known for starring in the classic 80s film Ghostbusters as Egon. In Bedazzled, Brandon Fraser plays Elliot, an overly friendly and annoying pushover that doesn't take social cues from people, and is unliked by people as a result. The fun begins when Elliot sees an attractive woman in a bar and says, Dear God, I would do anything to have that girl in my life. As a result, the devil played by Elizabeth Hurley makes an appearance. Elliot makes a deal with the devil for his soul in exchange for seven wishes. Elliot makes wishes, but in the devil's fashion, she grants them, but in ways that are not exactly as he expects. Like him having to be rich, but him having to be a drug lord living in a dangerous life as a caveat. In the end, I was rooting for Elliot to have a good outcome. In my opinion, this is one of the better Nuon films. Nuon Enhanced Features You can access the Nuon Enhanced Features through the Special Features menu. If you try to access it through a regular DVD player, you will just get a message saying that these features are available only on new and enhanced DVD players. The boot up screen shows a variant of the DVD cover, with Brandon Fraser having a more surprised look, and it also a snake on Elizabeth Hurley's left side. You can see the documents that Brandon has to sign with text, loading new on features. New on enhancements. In the special features section, the special new on enhanced features will be in the new on features menu selection. You will be presented with the following new one extras. Vidis, gamma zooms, hyper slides, and scene selection. The extras are usually the same types across all new one enhanced DVDs. I will get into more detail once we get to the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai. Dr. Doodle 2, a film released by 20th Century Fox on October 23, 2001. Dr. Doodle 2 is a year 2000 comedy starring Eddie Murphy. It's a sequel to the 1998 film Dr. Doodle. 
It's not the only Dr. Doolittle film series, with the first coming out in 1967 and another released in 2020 starring Robert Downey Jr. Dr. Doolittle is played by Eddie Murphy who portrays a veterinary doctor who can communicate with all types of animals when no one else can. The late great Steve Irwin even makes a brief appearance in the movie. Where the first movie takes place in the city, Dr. Doolittle 2 takes place in the woods with the doctor and his family, with an array of wild animals to talk to Dr. Doolittle. Animals are now coming to Dr. Doolittle for help in droves. The animals plead with Dr. Doolittle to save the forest from loggers who wish to destroy it. Dr. Doolittle finds a way to save the forest by halting deforestation because he discovers that an endangered species lives in the woods, but only one bear of that species lives in the forest. So, Dr. Doolittle finds the one other bear of that species, a circus bear, and tries to have the circus bear mate with the wild bear in order to save an endangered species, and as a result gives the government a reason to not allow loggers to cut down the forest. During a brief training scene for the bear, the beginning of Eye of the Tiger is played. Arnold Schwarzenegger also makes a voice appearance as the voice of the white wolf, even saying his catchphrase, Hasta la vista baby. The movie can be a little obnoxious at times due to various shouting characters and loud personalities coming from the talking animals, not to mention Eddie Murphy's also loud personality. This movie is aimed at young children though, so campy wackiness is to be expected. Dr. Doolittle is a fun movie for a younger audience that has a lot of animals to see with a great positive message about preserving natural habitat. Nuon Enhanced Features The message loading Nuon features over a white screen is presented. Planet of the Apes is the 2001 Tim Burton directed remake of the 1968 classic Planet of the Apes film. It was released by 20th Century Fox on November 20, 2001. Planet of the Apes is a 2001 science fiction film starring Mark Wahlberg who plays the astronaut Captain Leo Davidson who crashes down to a planet and discovers a world dominated by apes that rule over humans. The late and great Michael Clark Duncan also makes an appearance in this movie, playing the role of Atar an ape bent on stopping Mark Wahlberg's character Captain Leo Davidson. Captain Leo's goal is to try to reach his other crew members from his space station and he brings along with him humans and apes from the planet along with him on the journey as they do their best to evade opposing apes. As with all Tim Burton films, this film has a great artistic style to it with lush forests, desert lands, and starry skies. Even with all its marvels, I still prefer the original 1968 film over this one. New on Enhanced Features There's an intro screen shown over a black background with the Planet of the Apes logo that reads, Loading New on Features. The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension was released by MGM on January 4, 2002. It's a 1984 science fiction film starring an all-star cast including Peter Weller, John Lithgow, Ellen Barkin, Christopher Lloyd, and Jeff Goldblum. Buckaroo Banzai is a scientist and musician who uses a special vehicle to go past the speed of sound and along with attached devices is able to go through a mountain and reach to another dimension in existence, the 8th dimension to be exact, hence the title Across the 8th Dimension. Doing so, he even captures a creature from there on his vehicle. Through an electric charge over telephone transmission for the space dwelling interdimensional beings, Buckaroo Banzai is able to see aliens that are disguised by normal eyesight as humans to normal human beings, similar to the movie They Live, only this movie came out 4 years previously. The film has a campy light feel to it with silly looking aliens trying to get to Buckaroo Banzai. This is a weird 80s film set in New Jersey that may be too strange for the average viewer, but if you feel at home with Choma's The Toxic Avenger, then you may also like this film. New on Enhanced Features At startup, we are introduced with a white loading screen that says loading features for the adventures of Buckaroo Banzai, with a graphic in the center that shows desert and mountains in the background. The new on Enhanced Features include Vidis, featuring a jet car, footage from the film with information in text, gadgets and gizmos, Commentary Digest, featuring commentary on the first 18 minutes of the film. Even the title uh, is problematic. Uh, the Adventures of Buck Rubanzai was, uh, was forced on us by the studio. It was going to be Buck Rubanzai. Gamma Zooms, Jet Car Designs, Still Image of Black and White Concept Art Sketches, Tour Bus Schematics, Complex 88 Schematics. You could zoom in, but low resolution image makes reading text in the image difficult. Scene Selection, Almost Instant Scene Selection. After critical funding collapsed shortly after September 11, 2001, BM Labs filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in December 2001, only a year after the release of the new one. BM Labs was acquired by Genesis Microchip in February of 2002. Genesis Microchip hired the remaining 50 VM Labs employees, but would end up stopping all Nuon projects in July of 2002. Five years later, on December 11, 2007, an announcement was made that Genesis Microchip was acquired by ST Microelectronics, Europe's largest semiconductor chip maker based on revenue. 
After leaving VM Labs and Genesis Microchip in 2002, Richard Miller went on to become a consultant at NVIDIA in 2003, then a short period as a consultant at Apple, then a few other companies over the years until his current position starting in 2012 as Executive Vice President of Technology at Pixelworks. After leaving VM Labs in 2001, John Matheson joined NVIDIA and became team leader on several Tegra processors, a series of processor chipsets that to this day power current game systems like the Nintendo Switch. Jeff Minter went on to help create Neon, the visualizer for the Xbox 360 media player, and several video games including Tempest 4000 in 2018 for the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Windows. Bill Roebuck went on to work at NVIDIA from 2001 to 2016 as general manager. He continues to this day working on bringing new gaming experiences to the public. In a way, the new one provided some hardcore Atari fans an extended life after the demise of the Atari Jaguar. If the Xbox is to be considered the unofficial Dreamcast 2 because of Microsoft's involvement with the Dreamcast by some gamers, then I feel that it's fair to suggest that the new one should be considered the unofficial Jaguar 2 because of its many team members that had involvement with the Jaguar and its small library of sequels to Atari Jaguar games. While Nuon never became the Mario killer, VM Labs was ambitious in their attempt to reach a wider audience beyond gamers, to a more home theater and mainstream electronics consumer. But they didn't account for most home theater customers not being interested in gaming, and gamers not being interested in high-priced, casual gaming home theater equipment. The following is noted in their FAQ. From Nuondome.com, the official Nuon FAQ. Archived from the old Nuon.tv website from June 11, 1999. Why will Nuon be successful when so many other new gaming and interactive platforms have failed? Nuon will succeed by becoming a standard feature embedded in the next generation of consumer video entertainment products. To date, in the United States, video game market penetration reaches approximately 30%. By comparison, consumer video entertainment products such as TVs, VCRs, and cable boxes have nearly all achieved total market penetration. It is projected that digital consumer video entertainment products will replace their analog counterparts and achieve total market penetration within the next 5 to 10 years. The Nuon technology is designed to be embedded inside the next generation of digital consumer video entertainment products, and it's through this vehicle of digital video entertainment that Nuon will achieve a very high market penetration. While they weren't completely wrong about video entertainment, the PlayStation 2 was able to enter the market for gamers who wanted a great gaming experience, and also for consumers of home media that wanted a cheap DVD player. Essentially going in with a complete opposite strategy and foreseeing the growing video game market that needed to be catered to. Sony was able to conquer the market because they capitalized on the PlayStation 2 being backwards compatible with their extremely successful PlayStation 1, its DVD player capabilities, its vast third party support, being owners of one of the major film studios Sony Pictures, and undercutting VM Labs on the price point by selling the PlayStation 2 at a loss because they had the financial resources that allowed them to be able to make it up with video game sales. VM Labs with their Nuon platform had no console to be backwards compatible with, and basically no third party support, as well as only having two film studios making Nuon enhanced media that merely tested the format. They were financially struggling to stay afloat, unable to take losses or rely on video game sales to help them recoup any losses. The Nuon was an ambitious dream that could have been more of a success had it perhaps hit the market maybe a year earlier and emphasized its gaming capabilities more to consumers and third party developers. But it tried to be a jack of all trades, yet a master of none, like the Philips CDI, the Panasonic 3DO, and the Apple Pippin before it. Even later consoles like the Xbox One, when it was first released in 2013, tried to market itself as a media streaming box that also played video games. Initially it did poor until Microsoft changed their strategy. Is the new one fondly remembered by many people today? No. It unfortunately didn't even reach the radar for most people. But its innovations live on provided powerful interactivity to DVD media that wasn't available on standard DVD players, something feature media like the Blu-ray was able to provide better. Also, its visualization features essentially live on in the Xbox 360 media player thanks to Jeff Minter. In the present day, as a game system to have in one's collection, I wouldn't recommend getting a new one based on its game library. Almost every game or variant of them can be had elsewhere, except for perhaps Tempest 3000. If Tempest 2000 for the Atari Jaguar or Tempest 4000 for Windows, Xbox One, or PlayStation 4 simply won't do it for you. As for the Nuon Enhanced DVD titles, all of them are now available on Blu-ray except for Dr. Doolittle 2. And as a media player, it has a low resolution of 480i at best as a DVD player in the age of the 4K Ultra HD Blu-ray, making it obsolete. I will however always remember the Nuon for peeking outside the box, for its dream to provide gaming to the masses. VM Labs really put effort into the product and actually produced the game system. 
Whereas other small startups of the era with ambitious game system dreams never materialized like the Andrema L600 that simply became vaporware. The new one had enough planning behind the scenes and revenue to at least make their dreams a reality. However, a short time period that graced the shelves was its presence. And that's really commendable for a small startup. Happy 20th anniversary, new one. Let me know what you think of the new one in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like, share it, and subscribe to my channel. Thank you.